while I'm doing that, why don't we get started, if that's okay with everyone? I don't want to wait too long. Um, but hello, and welcome to our um, Strengthening Survivorship Workshop. We're so thankful that you've all joined us today um, on the, for this amazing event. We have a really great group of panel presenters. Before we get started, I just want to inform everybody that we are going to be recording this workshop. Um, your face will not be shown, but if you have any questions after the fact um, or would like to view the presentation later on, please send me a private message and I can get the edited version over to you once I have it. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat box below. We will address all the questions at the end of the presentation during our Q&A section. So I will read all of the typed out uh, questions at that time. Um, without further ado, let's get started with our presenters. Eduardo, if you wanna hit next. First, we're gonna hear from Burfin Mamut, who is gonna be presenting on exercise guidelines for cancer survivors. Burfin is a physical therapist specializing in oncology and lymphedema therapy. She's also a cancer exercise specialist. Burfin has been at Mount Sinai for almost four years now. During her time here, she's developed the lymphedema and oncology physical therapy program at Mount Sinai downtown. And seeing her patients get and feel better is really what drives Burfin's passion. So without further ado, Burfin, if you wanna take it away. Okay, um, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for having me here. So um, um, as Emily mentioned, I'm gonna present on exercise guidelines for cancer survivors. Um, as many of you may know, both cancer and its treatments introduce various of side effects, often not only affecting survivors' physical health, but also mental health and quality of life. So really affecting um, overall well-being. So today I want to talk about um, which I want to talk about common side effects and how exercise and physical activity may help with these side effects. So here's a um, list of common side effects. It definitely affects physical function, causing weakness, tightness, and limited mobility in the treated area. Um, cancer treatment can also result in pain, um, which is something that's common within the first few months after the treatment. However, up to 70% of patients can actually suffer from chronic pain after they complete their treatment. Um, fatigue is especially common with chemotherapy and it's characterized as severe tiredness that's not in proportion to the level of exertion and it usually doesn't improve with rest. It can definitely interfere with daily living, mood, um, work, relationships with others, um, physical activity and quality of life certainly. Um, Lymphedema is a common concern as well, um, especially with lymph node dissection and radiation, which are the main risk factors for lymphedema. But obesity, extensive surgery, infections also can increase someone's risk of developing lymphedema as well. Um, lymphedema is most commonly seen with breast and gynecological cancers, but it can most certainly affect patients with other cancer diagnoses as well, depending on the location of the cancer and also types of treatments they receive. Radiation fibrosis is a side effect of radiation, and it can develop either during radiation or after completion of treatment. It can be superficial, just affecting the skin and the structures right underneath the skin. But depending on the dose you um, receive, um, it can also affect the deeper structures, causing darkening and thickening of the skin, and as well as scarring in the radiated area, which can um, later cause all sorts of muscle imbalances, musculoskeletal issues, and also um, chronic pain in this patient population. Chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and radiation can all, um, especially um, radiation to the chest wall with breast, lung, and Hodgkin lymphoma diagnosis can lead to structural changes and damage to um, heart muscle and also blood vessels that supply the heart with oxygen and um, nutrients. And with chemotherapy, anthracycline specifically can also affect cardiovascular health. 
bone loss and bone weakness is another common health concern, um, especially with hormone positive breast and prostate cancers. Uh, with these treatments, they um, try to reduce the number, um, the level of estrogen and progesterone in, in our body, which is very crucial in bone health. So um, patients who are on immunotherapy can suffer from bone loss, um, specifically osteoporosis, which can later on put them on risk for fractures. Chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy is also a non-complication. Um, it's pretty much seen with taxane and platinum-based chemotherapy, chem chemotherapeutic agents. Um, it can affect up to 60% of patients, and it presents itself as numbness and tingling in hands and feet. And if symptoms become um, severe enough, it can also affect strength, um, causing ba balance impairments and difficulty walking. The good news is that regular exercise and physical activity can um, imp um, can help with most of these side effects. Um, we can go to the next slide. So it can definitely improve physical function, emotional well-being, bone health, cardiovascular health, and it can lower fatigue levels, um, lower risk of lymphedema and neuropathy symptoms. And there is now evidence uh, from studies actually indicating um, that regular exercise can actually increase survivorship by 50 to 60 percent. Um, strongest evidence for that is currently for breast and colorectal cancers because most of the research is done um, in these areas. But I'm confident that as more and more research is done, this can be translated into other cancer diagnoses as well. We can actually move into uh, next slide and the, the next one. Yeah. So current recommendation is that cancer survivors should engage in moderate to vigorous intensity of aerobic and resistance exercise to manage all these side effects that we talked about, both short and long-term side effects. Um, there are different types of exercises. We can move into the next slide. So aerobic exercise is anything that increases the heart rate. So brisk walking, swimming, cycling, um, all counts towards aerobic exercise. So if we're talking about moderate intensity, then the recommendations are 30 minutes a day, uh, five times a week. Um, of course, if um, you are not able to tolerate that, you can certainly break it down to five to 10 minute sessions um, and doing it a few times. So you're still targeting that 30 minutes, um, 30 minute sessions a day. And for vigorous intensity exercises, anywhere between 75 to 150 minutes a week is sufficient for us to see these results. Strength training is recommended twice a week. Um, free weights, body weights, and resistance bands all counts over strength training and flexibility should be done every day. When it comes to what mode of exercises we should be doing for which um, side effects, um, there is strong evidence that um, showing that moderate intens intensity aerobic training three times a week for 12 weeks or combined with strength training performed twice a week for anywhere between 6 to 12 weeks can actually significantly reduce anxiety as well as depressive symptoms in cancer survivors, both during and after treatment. Um, however, strength training alone does not seem to be enough to help improve emotional health. We can move into the next slide. Moderate intensity aerobic training performed again three times a week for 12 weeks also significantly reduces cancer-related fatigue. Um, again, we see these benefits both during and after treatment. And combined aerobic and strength training performed two to three times a week can still be effective in reducing fatigue. Um, with a combined exercise program, there's no data on how long the ex exercise program should be um, in order to see a significant improvement. But in general, we see a greater reduction in fatigue when exercise sessions are longer than 30 minutes and when the program is longer than 12 weeks. And when it comes to lymphedema, um, historically, recommendations were to refrain from any aerobic 
and or strength training um, in order to avoid onset of lymphedema. But now there's, a, there's strong evidence um, suggesting that a progressive strength training program focusing on large muscle groups can actually prevent and or lower the risk of developing lymphedema when performed in a supervised setting and with the principle of start slow, progress slow, meaning starting with low intensity, low duration, low weights, and progressing everything slowly. The recommended frequency is two to three times a week, and the recommended length is 52 weeks. And in general, aerobic exercise is safe uh, with patients who are at risk for lymphedema or who have lymphedema, but there is no sufficient evidence suggesting that aerobic exercise can prevent lymphedema. Um, when it comes to physical function and ability to perform daily activities, there is strong evidence that moderate intensity aerobic training, um, resistance training, or combined aerobic plus resistance training performed three times weekly for eight to 12 weeks can significantly improve self-reported physical function. Um, and when it comes to bone health, exercise can improve bone health, but evidence is, in, is actually inconsistent when it comes to this, because in order for us to see um, a significant improvement with bone health, we need to actually, um, do high intensity, high impact training, which is two to three times of our body weight. And unfortunately that is not possible with all cancer survivors, especially um, patients who have um, osteoporosis or bone metastasis. So um, I think that's the reason why the research has been inconsistent when it comes to that. So, um, in terms of how much you should exert yourself when you're doing either aerobic or strength training, recommendations are always staying around moderate intensity, which is um, on this Borg scale, which is an exertion scale. Um, moderate intensity is anywhere between 12 to 14, so that's um, somewhat exhausting. Um, so you should feel like your heart rate is increasing and your body is warming up, but talking is um, should be still um, pretty easy. We can move on to the next slide. So not everyone can tolerate um, moderate intensity exercises. Um, so when it comes to um, starting, especially during chemotherapy, some patients can um, tolerate low intensity. So Alternative exercise interventions like yoga and tai chi can be helpful, creating really opportunities for cancer survivors to participate in low intensity exercises when they cannot participate in traditional exercises. Um, gentle hatha and restorative yoga, which consist of breathing exercises, postural exercises, and um, mindfulness exercises can actually improve cancer-related fatigue when performed two to three times a week um, and for 75 minutes each session. It can actually reduce fatigue up to 50%, which of course allows greater engagement in daily activities, social activities, and um, physical activity and exercise, etc. And Tai Chi is a low to moderate intensity intervention. Um, it's equipment free. It has three components, physical movement, breathing, and mindfulness. It focuses on sense of movement and combines um, slow flowing movements with diaphragmatic breathing. So stretching, relaxation, and body awareness. It has been proposed to improve sleep um, because it promotes a state of relaxation by reducing inflammation in, in the body. It may also improve cardiorespiratory um, health because it involves thoracic um, like rib expansion, so stretching, um, and strengthening uh, the muscles that we use for breathing. We can move on to the next slide. So 
walking is another great way to start um, exercising and jumping back to exercising uh, either during or after treatment. This is a great um, program. It's from American Heart Association. It's a six week program. They also have a 12 week program. So if anyone is interested in the 12 week program, I can um, definitely email that. But as you can see, week one starts with easy walks, five to 10 minutes. Um, stretching is done almost every day and um, you get rest um, days as well. And then over time towards week six, like each week, the walks are longer and um, week six is a total of 24 to 34 minute walk. So um, by week week six, we're already, hit, we're already hitting the recommended time, which is 30 minutes a day. <clears throat> it's also important to know when to stop exercising. So um, if you develop fever, um, extreme tiredness, that's unusual, especially for you, unusual or sudden muscle weakness, sudden onset of um, feeling nauseous while exercising, dizziness, lightheadedness, blurred vision, uh, fainting, chest pain, if you look pale, um, and if you have either new or worsening of lymphedema symptoms, like swelling, um, you should definitely stop. And also if you have severe anemia, if your levels are less than eight, that's also another red flag for us to stop. And you should definitely reach out to your doctor to get medical clearance to go back to exercising. And we have some yellow flags um, when it comes to special considerations in the next slide. So for um, patients who are immunocompromised, you know, avoiding public gyms, pools, um, public transportation while you're still um, immunocompromised is very important in order to prevent getting sick and to prevent infections. Dehydration um, is another yellow flag. So if you have severe vomiting, diarrhea, then you should wait uh, at least 24 hours before you go back to exercising. With chemotherapy also, we usually would like to wait about 24 hours before you start exercising again. Um, adriamycin, um, we um, don't recommend exercising on the day of chemotherapy and only low intensity exercise should be done within the 24 to 48 hours after infusion because this medication can make the heart beat irregularly for about 24 hours after, um, afterwards. And when it comes to blood glucose, um, if it's below 100 or above 250, you should wait until it's within normal limits. When With bone metastases, um, patients can still exercise. However, it's important to work with someone who is familiar with, um, with this diagnosis and who has um, experience treating this population because there are certain exercises that cannot be done with bone metastasis. So um, that's it for, for my part. And um, hopefully I'll have some questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Burpin. That was extremely informative and we appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, we're gonna move on next to Brittany Craig, who's going to present on nutrition for survivorship. Brittany Craig is a registered dietitian nutritionist who is board certified specialist in oncology nutrition. She completed her master's in clinical nutrition at New York University and her bachelor's in science at Ithaca College. Brittany has been practicing as a dietitian for over 10 years now and is passionate about using evidence-based nutrition practices to support cancer patients in a holistic way throughout their treatment. Um, so Brittany, take it away. Thanks, Emily. And thanks everyone for having me this afternoon. Um, so I apologize, I don't have slides, but I will just be talking um, about what the current recommendations are in terms of diet and lifestyle for cancer survivorship. Um, I won't go into physical activity since Burfin just did that, and but I do want to emphasize that we uh, as the dietitians also encourage physical activity during treatment if possible, and especially for cancer survivorship. Diet alone is not going to do it all in terms of keeping you healthy and re reducing the risk of recurrence. So I just want to emphasize that um, 
and Burfin did a really great job of explaining it way better than I would be able to, of course. <laughs> so now um, in terms of diet, the most current research, I'll dive into it further in a moment, but we do encourage what we call a plant-based diet. This doesn't mean vegetarian by any means, um, but it does include more of what we would call a Mediterranean style diet, which I'll go into more. Um, but the main you know, recommendations for sort of this healthy eating pattern is limiting any red and processed meats, um, avoiding if possible sugar sweetened beverages or at least reducing them from your diet and avoiding any highly processed foods. A lot of food is of course processed today, but what we mean by highly processed is like, um, you know, like microwavable meals with tons of ingredients. It, it's trickier these days because there are more healthier versions of everything, which I'm really happy to see. But my, I guess the easiest way I could put it is if you look at the back of a food packaging and the ingredients are a mile long, that's an example of highly processed and probably not so good for you. Um, so more of the whole foods that you're able to incorporate into your diet, the better. So again, including lots of vegetables, lots of fresh fruits, it doesn't have to be fresh straight from the you know, produce section. It could be frozen, which is just as fine. In fact, sometimes even healthier because usually vegetables and fruits are frozen at their point, um, like the perfect ripeness period. So it preserves a lot of vitamins and minerals that way. But just finding a way to incorporate more fruits and vegetables into your diet can be very beneficial. Limiting or avoiding alcohol is also found to be very beneficial for cancer survivorship and reduction of cancer recurrence. It does depend a little bit on the type of cancer. Uh, for example, head and neck cancer, gastric cancer, colon cancer tend to be at much higher risks of cancer recurrence or, yeah, excuse me, cancer recurrence with alcohol intake, but breast cancer is also one that has a risk. Um, so the general guideline from the American Cancer Society is if you don't drink alcohol, don't start. If you do limit it, ideally the recommendation is one serving per day for women and two servings per day for men. Um, so then going into, I did mention like this plant-based diet, Mediterranean style, it is a little vague and there are there is actually currently a lot of debate right now over what a Mediterranean diet is. Um, but the main thing is that it's whole foods. It's avoiding a lot of these processed foods, processed snacks. It's incorporating vegetables at every meal if possible. It's incorporating fruits two to three times a day. It's using olive oil. So you know, healthy fats are important in this diet, olive oil, nuts, seeds. Um, these are all really beneficial for our heart health. And uh, I mentioned nuts, uh, legumes, beans, at least three to four times a week, you know, uh, black beans, red beans, chickpeas, whatever you prefer, have a big benefit to our diet. Um, mainly, well, not mainly, there's a lot of very good nutrients in legumes, but it's also very high in fiber. And another component of this plant-based Mediterranean style diet is making sure you have a good amount of fiber in your diet. A good gauge is 30 grams. I'm not saying that, that you have to go start counting how many grams of fiber you have in a day, but if you feel like you're not quite at that mark, it could potentially be useful to try for a few weeks to start to gradually incorporate more fiber into your diet. This is healthy for many, many reasons. Yes, for reduction of cancer and cancer recurrence, it's important for heart health. It's important for gastrointestinal health, GI regularity. Um, it's important for reducing the risk of various cancers. So when I say high fiber, that's pretty much most of the foods that I mentioned, vegetables, beans, legumes, they're all very high in fiber, whole grains, like whole wheat breads, um, uh, other like quinoa, millet, other types of grains are all wonderful to include into your diet and very beneficial. Um, and then proteins as well. So I wanted to touch upon that. Healthy fish, excellent. Again, it doesn't have to be a vegetarian diet. Eggs are great. Um, even red meat in moderation is okay. The recommendation is about two servings a week. If you like to include it in your diet, you don't have to. Um, if you don't eat red meat, no need to add it in, but 
protein is still important. So we want to make sure that whether it's protein from vegetarian sources, you know, beans, tofu, nuts, uh, perhaps yogurt, if you include that in your diet, or fish, chicken, eggs, some red meat, again, perfectly okay. It's just all about the balance. And then um, that's the main points for the diet. Lastly, I also wanted to discuss supplements. We do get a lot of questions about supplements. And right now, the general recommendation is that it's not indicated for cancer survivorship and cancer recurrence. However, everybody on an individual level, of course, might have different needs. And so that's where it can be really beneficial just to discuss further with your doctor or your dietitian. Um, if you're following this healthy eating pattern that we discussed and you are generally healthy, then most likely you don't need additional supplements, maybe a daily multivitamin, maybe vitamin D if you know you're deficient. Um, but again, there's various reasons why, of course, it might be worth considering. Um, and we're always available to discuss with you further and, and what research we do know on certain supplements that might have benefit. Um, and, and then lastly, I'll just say, of course, if you're going through cancer treatment or you did, you know that it can be very difficult to follow this type of diet that I went over. And that's okay. This is more, again, for once you're feeling well, trying to um, keep yourself healthy, keep yourself in that cancer survivorship realm, then this is the diet to follow. But we by no means expect anyone going through treatment and having you know potential side effects to, to be able to follow this diet. Um, but it's just the best that you can, the best that you can incorporate these, this, these type of food patterns, um, the more beneficial for you. So that is it actually for me. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. That was great. Lots of great recommendations. Um, next, we are going to hear from Lauren Fish. Eduardo, if you want to bring that back up. Thank you. Um, and Lauren is going to be presenting on mind-body practices for stress reduction. Lauren has been a New York State licensed massage therapist for over 25 years. She's a graduate of the Swedish Institute College of Health Sciences. Lauren holds a bachelor's degree in dance education from New York University and a master's degree in dance movement therapy from Hunter College. She's also received training in Reiki, oncology massage, and mindfulness-based stress reduction under the direction of John Kabat-Zinn. Lauren was the massage therapy to a cardiac surgery patient and coordinated employee wellness program. She has worked in a variety of clinical settings with diverse patient populations, including inpatient psychiatric patients, medical patients, and hospice patients. She has been a member of the massage therapy team at the Dubin Breast Center and the Tisch Cancer Institute since 2016, where she is able to fulfill her passion of providing care to patients and their caregivers in a hospital setting. So thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Emily. It's so nice to, to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Mostly I'm going to be doing um, an experiential today. Um, I want to talk about ways that stress affects our bodies and how we can combat the physiological uh, effects in our bodies when it's, when it's a bit negative. First, I'll talk with you just a little bit about our massage therapy program. We have a staff of six massage therapists now. We're all New York State licensed massage therapists with extensive training in oncology massage. Our program was started by Jennifer Ashton and she began when the Dubin Center opened. We're uptown on the Upper, upper East Side. And now the program's grown where we have, as I said, six, six licensed massage therapists. We practice different modalities, including Reiki, which Emily is gonna discuss uh, shortly. Um, we practice foot reflexology and hand reflexology, which is a system that involves the theory that there are different reflex areas in the feet and in the palms of the hand as well that um, are directly or have some, they represent different parts of the body. So in effect, by working on the feet and the hands, you're having a soothing effect on the whole entire body. Um, we also practice um, neck and shoulder massage. We offer hand massage, scalp massage, and other mind-body practices, some of which we'll be doing today. Um, and we also offer guided imagery to patients and teach breath techniques as well um, when that's needed. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about stress and how it affects our body. So you can move to the next slide. Uh, so one of a, a physiological reaction that occurs often when we're under stress is called the fight or flight response. And this is something that evolved during the cavemen era when there were direct threats of attackers. And right now it's still within our system. And um, what it is, it's a physiological reaction to an event that is perceived as stressful or frightening. The sympathetic nervous system is activated and triggers an acute stress response, which involves the secretion of stress hormones, accelerated heart rate, elevated blood pressure, rapid and shallow breathing, along with many other symptoms as well. Sweaty palms, uh, nervous feeling, oftentimes tight musculature. Um, you can move on to the next slide, please. So the good news is that the term relax, that, that relaxation response is an opposite physiological effect of the fight or flight response. And this is something that a doctor by the name of Herbert Benson, who was a Harvard trained cardiologist, um, had coined that term. Um, he was a pioneer in the field of mind body medicine and really taught people ways that they can, can combat that other heightened state that happens in our nervous system when we're under stress. And I also want to emphasize that stress is a natural part of everyday life. We all have stress in our lives, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it often helps propel us to deal with different challenges that we have in our lives. It becomes harmful when it's cumulative. So it's really wonderful to have different mind-body practices or different exercise regimens that was already mentioned to help move your, your body into more of a relaxed and calm state. Um, so as I said, the relaxation response, it's the physiological counter to the fight or flight response. The parasympathetic nervous system is activated in order to restore the body and the mind to a calm and relaxed state. And what I do wanna emphasize is that all of these different uh, modalities that I'll talk about shortly really involve a lot of practice and it's really a learned skill. But when, you, uh, when the relaxation response is elicited, the heart rate slows down, breathing becomes slower and deeper, blood pressure drops or stabilizes, and muscles relax. Um, you can move to the next slide, please. So there are different ways to elicit the relaxation response. Therapeutic massage, meditation, the body scan, which we will do, we'll do an abbreviated form of that, yoga, breath work, guided imagery, and there are countless other modalities as well, like Tai Chi and other things as well. So what I'd like to do now is have us do a little bit of an experiential so you can get the experience of different, different techniques. And so I'm hoping that you'll walk away with some tools and you'll also see what resonates with you and what you're most receptive to. Um, so start by just centering yourself and getting comfortable, whether you're seated in a chair or if you're reclining, just become aware of what you're feeling in your body at the moment. And if you're comfortable right now, you can close your eyes or you can just have your gaze be a little bit in front of you on the floor in front of you, whatever you're most comfortable with. And just take a brief moment to do a little bit of an inventory and just notice how you're feeling. Notice if there are any particular symptoms that you feel, any particular areas of discomfort. And without judgment, just simply notice. And now begin to bring your attention to your breath. You can simply notice the air moving in and out of your nostrils. You can notice a gentle rising and falling in your chest. Or perhaps you might notice your abdomen rising and falling as you breathe in and out. Just take a few moments to bring your awareness to the breath without trying to change the rhythm of the breath. And you might notice that your mind is starting to wander. And if you notice that, just simply bring your attention right back to the breath. And now you can slowly open your eyes if your eyes were closed. 
And that is a form of meditation, breath awareness. And it's very natural for people who, even who have been meditating for years, to have a racing mind. And what you simply do is you use your breath as an anchor to anchor yourself into the present, into the present moment. Um, but right now, I want us to do a little bit of movement. I don't know if you can see me very well, but wherever you are, if you're seated in a chair, feel your feet rooted on the floor and be aware of the crown of your head reaching up towards the ceiling. And now you're gonna to start to lift your shoulders up. You're gonna raise your shoulders really high and then you're gonna release. This is an area where many of us hold a lot of tension, um, the neck and the shoulder. So it's a really good idea to mobilize that area. So once again, we're gonna do it now with coordinating the breath. I'm gonna have you inhale as you lift your shoulders up and exhale as you release. And now you can inhale through your nose with your mouth closed. And as you exhale, you can blow as if you're blowing out a candle and lower your shoulders. And one more time, you're gonna inhale lifting and exhale, lower your shoulders. And now you can just raise your right arm up within your comfort level. You can even support your elbow with your arm if you have limited range of motion. Wiggle your fingers a little bit and then stretch to your full capacity. Take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, let out a little sigh. <sighs> and now do the same on the other side, reaching your arm, moving your fingertips, stretch as much as you comfortably can, and then let out a sigh. And now we're gonna do that with both arms. We're gonna reach both arms all the way up, take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, let out a little sigh. <sighs> and then see if you can drop your chin down to your chest. So you're stretching out the posterior neck muscles. Take a few deep breaths and then come right back up to center. Okay, so it's a great, a great thing to do during the course of the day if you're working or whatever it is you're doing, you can just take a few moments to do a little bit of mobilization of the shoulders, get a little bit in touch with the breathing. I'm gonna do a very, very quick um, mind-body practice called the body scan. So for sake of time, this will be a little bit quick, but you can do this in a very lengthened way as well. But this way, you'll just get a taste of what it's like to have an awareness of your body. So if you are comfortable closing your eyes, once again, you can close your eyes or you can have your gaze be in front of you. And once again, take note of how you're feeling without judging yourself and begin to just bring your awareness to both of your feet, simply noticing your feet, noticing the length of all of your toes, the width of your feet. And now you're gonna move your awareness up to your heels and your calf muscles, allowing yourself to relax the muscles in your calves. And now allow your awareness to move up to your knees, and your legs, your quadriceps, and your hamstrings, allowing yourself to relax the musculature in the legs, and moving your awareness to your hip joints, the buttocks, your pelvis, bringing your awareness up to the lower back, the mid back, your upper back, and become aware of the space between your shoulder blades, allowing those muscles to soften and relax, letting go of tension. And now become aware of the front of your torso. And once again, become aware of the breath, perhaps allowing yourself to take deeper, fuller breaths. And bring your awareness up to the shoulders and your neck bringing your awareness to your hands, your forearms, your wrists, your upper arms and your shoulders, and let that awareness move up to the neck and to the face, relaxing the jaw muscles, relaxing and softening the eyes and the scalp. And now be aware of your whole entire body, all the way from your feet up into your head, 
and take note once again of how you feel and notice if you feel any differently than you did in the very beginning. And you can slowly open up your eyes. And once again, lift your shoulders all the way up and release. And I'm gonna now pass this on to Emily, my coworker. Thank you so much, Lauren. Yes, we're gonna pass it over to Emily now, um, but before you get started, I'm gonna introduce you. Um, so Emily's gonna talk further about the Reiki practice of healing for us. Um, Emily is a massage therapist and Reiki master with a background in public health research. She has experience in both wellness center and hospital settings and joined the Dubin Breast Center massage therapy team at Mount Sinai in November, 2021. Emily is passionate about improving the patient experience and using body work to reduce stress among individuals facing mental and physical challenges. A graduate of Haverford College with a BA in psychology, Emily also received her master's in public health from the University of Washington and completed um, her massage therapy training at the Swedish Institute College of Health Sciences. So thank you so much for being with us, Emily. Great, thanks so much, Emily. Um, as Lauren said, we work together in the Dubin Breast Center in Mount Sinai uptown. Um, you can go to my next slide. Okay. Um, so Reiki is a natural healing system that originated in Japan in the 1890s. And the word literally translates to mean universal energy or universal life force. Um, the idea in Reiki is that the mind and body are completely connected. Um, so by relaxing our minds, easing our thoughts, and um, calming our emotions, we can also improve our physical health. The concepts in Reiki are similar to those of other Eastern modalities, such as acupuncture and shiatsu massage, um, and focusing on the idea of energy flowing through our bodies along um, specific pathways. And the idea that when we experience stress um, and challenges in our lives, those energetic pathways can become blocked or stuck. So the idea in Reiki is that through gentle hand positions, we can promote relaxation and improve the flow of energy in our bodies um, to improve wellness and physical health. Um, the Reiki practitioner is someone who has gone through a series of attunements, someone who's studied the history and the theories behind Reiki um, and learned specific symbols that are used in the practice. Um, the practitioner uses gentle hand positions on the receiver that are based on the seven major chakras. Chakras are energy centers and these correspond to physical parts of our body, so our um, organs, hormones, body systems, as well as to emotional and mental aspects of ourselves. The hand positions and placements are extremely gentle. We've probably all had the experience of how someone's touch done with the right, um, the positive intention um, can be so calming and therapeutic. And that's really as simple as what Reiki is all about. Um, Reiki can be done on anyone. There are really no contraindications. If someone cannot receive touch or does not want to for some reason, Reiki can be done from a distance. Um, Reiki can be done to yourself or in a group. And it's a great complement to whatever treatment or medical care someone is receiving. Um, it's also a great complement to massage therapy. Some people even refer it to massage therapy. So the goals of Reiki are to promote relaxation and balance through supportive gentle touch. Um, again, an important concept in Reiki is that the mind and body are connected. So by relaxing our minds, by reducing stress, we can improve health um, and physical well-being. Reiki is also very much about connecting with nature. The idea in Reiki is that we are channeling energy from the universe to heal the mind and body. Um, 
something that can be really helpful is spending time outside, um, spending time in a calming um, environment near trees, near water. And if that's not realistic, sometimes using imagery of nature, whatever is most calming to you, beach, waterfall, mountains, um, either looking at pictures or um, bringing those images to mind in a meditation um, can really help in the Reiki process. Um, another important concept in Reiki is uh, listening to our intuition, really tuning in to our bodies and to what we're experiencing, um, thinking about what we can do for ourselves. What are some things that are in our control? Um, so strengthening self-awareness and um, really thinking about how we can be empowered in our healing process, what are even small things that we can do to help ourselves feel better. Um, and lastly, creating positive intentions, creating positive energy for ourselves and for others um, is an important goal of Reiki. The experience of Reiki is very personal. Um, there's really no one right way to feel, um, but the Reiki session starts with an intake um, of getting the receiver to discuss their current state, what thoughts are on their mind, what emotions are feeling, and what sensations are having physically in their bodies. And this is the beginning of the process of really tuning in to the body. Many people describe feeling a deep relaxation. Um, sometimes new sensations come up. Sometimes people become aware of old injuries. Um, sometimes people become aware of things that are feeling good in their bodies, maybe things that were challenging last month might be feeling better this month. Um, people describe feeling in kind of a dreamlike state. They might see colors, visions, uh, memories might pop up. And people often experience a vibration or heat, especially in the area of the body where the practitioner's hands are placed. Um, people describe feeling lighter sometimes the sensation of floating. And people also describe feeling more grounded, um, more stable. Often people describe feeling kind of a, a clarity um, and hopefully some level of empowerment in their healing process. So here are some suggested positions um, for doing kind of a Reiki-based treatment on yourself. Um, again, traditionally, a Reiki session is done by a Reiki practitioner, um, but Reiki can be done on yourself either with the guidance of a Reiki practitioner or um, just on your own kind of bringing to mind the Reiki concepts. So best to use deep belly breaths um, and be really comfortable in your position, either lying down or seated comfortably with pillows. Um, feet on the ground or, or low to the ground, um, position to start with hands in the back of the head like this. You can clasp your fingers, hands over your eyes, hands cupped over your ears, hands over your throat or the back of your neck, your forearms touching, one hand on each shoulder. You can also cross your arms, kind of gently pull the shoulders down a little bit. You can place one hand on the heart and one hand on the belly. Do both hands on the heart, both hands on the belly. This is a, a nice way to really feel your breath. And depending on your position and your flexibility, you could do hands on your knees, hands on your feet. Um, if you're lying down, you should not do those. Um, and you can spend really as much time as feels good. So kind of traditionally, we do about five to 10 minutes in each position, but depending on how much time you have um, and how it's feeling, you can decide how much time. Now during the Reiki session, kind of similar to a meditation, um, it's best to do something that really works for you to help you relax. Um, 
some people really resonate with the body scan that Lauren described, kind of tuning into each area of the body and noticing any sensations, making an effort to relax that area. Um, another idea is to tune into your environment, especially if you're around nature. Um, really think about the sounds and sensations in the environment. Focusing on your breath is a great one. Slowing it down, deepening it, counting, um, thinking about how your body responds um, to slowing down your breath. For other people, it can be hard to really just let go of difficult thoughts. Um, and so we also suggest creating a gratitude list or intentionally bringing to mind things or people that make you happy, that make you feel calm and joyful. Um, you could also think about just really simple things that have happened today or in the past week um, that have been helpful in your healing process, really simple things that you're looking forward to, um, just making a, a point of bringing to mind positive thoughts for yourself. And I like to end by setting a positive intention for your healing process for a way of promoting um, healing. And this can be a nice uh, way to end the session, um, to debrief with yourself, um, to write it down, or debrief with the practitioner, um, anything that came up for you, um, and kind of talk out what that means and what is in your control that you can do um, in your healing process. So that relates back to the um, self-awareness and personal growth aspect of Reiki. Um, so that is Reiki, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Emily. It's great to hear about Reiki and how it can be you know, worked into the healing of survivorship. So thank you. Um, we're now going to move into the Q&A section of the presentation. We have um, just a few minutes. I do have one question in the chat box that I'm going to read off, but if anybody else has any questions that they'd like to ask any of the presenters, feel free to type them in the chat box below, or you can always, um, you know, raise your hand and, and ask verbally. Um, but the first question that I received is from Rosemary Garcia, and I believe it's her burfin. Um, she says that she has lymphedema and she couldn't get the test done due to a sulfur allergy. Um, so she has a FlexiTouch machine and she wants to know what other help she can get. She does not have a cancer diagnosis um, at this point, but burfin, any help or suggestions that you may have for her would be great. I also have, can I talk? Yeah, of course. I also have um, osteoporosis. I also have three herniated disc and bone on bone hip on both sides of the legs that are deteriorating. And um, sorry, I missed that. Do um, you have lymphedema in your leg or arm? I have it in both legs. Both legs, okay. I mean, uh, Flexi Touch is actually one of the um, compression devices that I like because you can adjust the pressure. Um, you can absolutely do that as long as you don't have any discomfort or pain with it. But if you haven't been um, to a lymphedema therapist and you haven't received any lymphedema treatments, I would highly recommend that because Flexi Touch is going to help you maintain swelling, but it's not going to help you reduce anything. What so I've I would been recommend noticing. getting the lymphedema treatment first. I, I went, they scheduled me for the scan for lipidemia, but then they found out that I'm allergic to sulfur, so I was never able to take the test. But I'm noticing that there's, I'm swelling up more. My hips are already bone on bone, both of them, I need a hip replacement. So I'm, it's so difficult because of the three herniated disc as well, and arthritis that I also have, plus sleep apnea and insomnia and mm -hmm. asthma it's so hard for me to function daily and I don't know what else I can do to make this feel better. Yeah. I mean, I, not everyone gets um, the test, the scan for, to be diagnosed with lymphedema. Um, I would definitely recommend um, going to cardiologist. Yes, I have to make one. sure everything. Yeah. And then um, go to your PCP. Once I, once they rule out everything else, then you can go to a lymphedema therapist and start treatment. So that's usually the route we take. 
my heart doctor just put me on aspirin because I have a blood clot in my leg. And my PCP doesn't do much about lipidemia. I looked into a place on 17th Street in my area and they told me they're not experienced with that either. And I would have to buy the wraps and it would be too costly. And my Medicare coverage wouldn't cover all the treatments. I mean, insurance wise, I'm not sure, but yeah, with the, I mean, with the PCP, the goal is to really, um, to rule out any other health conditions that might be causing the swelling. So just making sure there's nothing else going on. Um, and you're, you will be a safe, um, you will be a good candidate to be on the lymphedema treatment or program. So that's the purpose of getting medical clearance from those doctors, but they wouldn't treat you for your lymphedema. I also noticed that my hairs and my legs is fading out. Like, like my hairs are just, I'm not as hairy on my legs as I used to be. My arms the same way. I don't know if that's a lipidemia thing. I don't know. That's only see a cardiovascular doctor. Oh, my heart doctor. That Card, yeah, heart and then also vascular. Follow up with them. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything else I can do? I'm on a fasting diet. I lost 16 pounds so far. I'm nutrition. with diet I can't really help with because uh, it's not my specialty, but I would start with those two specialties, seeing a cardiology, uh, heart, heart, yeah, um, heart doctor and then vascular. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Do we have any other questions? We have about a minute left, so we probably have time for one more if anybody has anything. But if not, um, thank you all so much for being here today. If you have any questions that come up after the fact, feel free to email them to me. I can put my email in the chat um, and I can forward them to any of the presenters. Um, but we really appreciate you being here today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you to all of our presenters for all the amazing information. Thank you for putting it together. Of Thank course. you. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.